So remember, a pure colony is going to be one that contain only one species or one strain of bacteria. So the idea behind this is I can have a single cell, a Staphylococcus aureus land on my Petri dish. That single cell will start to replicate every 20 minutes. And then over time, it creates millions and millions and millions of clones of itself, which will then become visible to me as they're stacking up on each other. And that's the idea behind a colony. Now, that colony is going to be a little different than the colony beside it, which again, will still be Staph aureus, but it might have a little different mutation or might have something a little different with it. But it'll still test as a Staph aureus, just like we're all human, but we might have variations. Same idea. So it's a population of cells arising from a single cell. We also sometimes refer to colonies as CFUs. You might hear that in microbiology, like how many CFUs did you get on your plate? That stands for colony forming units. So how many colony forming units? That's important when we go into labs like food and water testing, or we want to see how much bacteria is present in our food and in our water. We're going to do a lab like that here. We're going to do some testing on some food items, and then we're going to um, do some testing on some water samples. And if you are curious about your home water, you can bring it in, and we'll test it and see how it works. So we'll see how good it is. So remember, the hardest thing about trying to get a pure colony is to try to isolate it. And so that's where we have that streak plate method. We learned it as a four step. It can also be a three step. So instead of having four quadrants, we can split it into three. It's a little bit faster. And it also lets you spread out that third quadrant a little bit more. So that, that way you get a little bit more chance for having isolated colonies there. So can you think of a reason why a colony wouldn't grow to like a huge size? We've seen them on our petri dishes. Why do you think that they're all about the same size when we see them? Like Staph aureus was all the same size. Why wouldn't I have a colony that's just like getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Doesn't have nutrients. Excellent. Remember, they're competing with each other. I'm giving them a little tiny dish with some food, and they're all competing for space and nutrients. So that's going to be one of the things that's going to limit their growth. Could a pure culture of bacteria be obtained by the street plate if there's only one desired microbe, one target, in a billion cells? What do you think? Is that possible? In the street, no. in the street plate. Yes. yes, it is. We actually do that whenever we do any kind of a fecal sample, a skin swab. We are trying to find the pathogen in all of that normal flora. And so we will have to separate it out from billions of different bacteria. So what happens when we grow bacteria and we get an interesting strain or we see a neat mutation? Um, we might want to preserve that. So for example, when we're doing antibiotic studies, if we find that an organism that we're testing is resistant to a lot of antibiotics, we'll save it and we'll send it to the CDC. And then they'll start looking and trying to figure out if there's another antibiotic that would work for it. And this is how we learn about different strains that are out there. So sometimes it's nice to be able to preserve and store our colonies or our cultures for future use. We also do that here. Um, your lab tech that helps us in the back, she sets up all of your cultures for you. She has them all stored as freezer stocks. So we're able to save them and use them from one week to the next without having to worry about completely regrowing them fresh. So when we preserve our bacterial cultures, What's going to happen is that we're going to basically preserve them in a deep freeze. So some instances, for example, like if we're growing a cell culture and we want to save it long term, what can happen is we'll put it into a vial. We'll put it into a vial and then we'll put that vial at like around minus 70. So you can have anywhere between minus 50 to minus 95. We usually use minus 70. And then that vial will freeze, and the bacteria stay in kind of a suspended animation state. I would always tease that it's kind of like the bacteria are sitting in this tube going, wow, it's getting kind of cold. And then they just freeze. And they just stay like that, right? And then you can take them out like a month later, a year later, a decade later, and put them on a petri dish, and they go cold, and they start growing. Like they have no idea that this time has passed. And so we have certain cultures, for example, that we've saved at Cal Poly that are from like the 60s that are pretty cool. We actually have a staph aureus up there that still reacts to penicillin. It's that old. 
So it's kind of fun to show it against like current staff and you know the old school staff, the retro staff as we call it. So the idea behind this, and the only way this works though, is we have to freeze them fast, which is why we put them at such a cold temperature. And the reason for that is that cold temperature, if it's fast, it doesn't hurt them. If it's slow, it'll form ice shards, and those ice shards are like little needles piercing them, and it can actually kill them. So we do what's called a flash freeze. We can also do lyophilization. This is freeze drying. Like if you ever go to the um, Army su Surplus store, they have like freeze dried ice cream. Like my kids love that stuff. I think it's gross. They love that kind of stuff. Like the astronaut food, they're all about that. So the idea behind that is you take your bacteria and you put them in a vacuum and you pull their moisture away. And you do it so fast that again, it kind of leaves them in like this, you know, stunned, suspended animation state where they look like a little dry powder. Then all I have to do is I add broth to them and it rehydrates their cells. And it's done so quickly, it actually doesn't damage them. And when I add the broth, they can come back. So the beauty of lyophilization is I don't have to worry about storing these in the cold. So if we don't have a negative 70 freezer here, I could still have these just stored at room temp. So they're still around those. So let's think about this then. If I'm working on a space station and it suddenly blows up or ruptures, we know unfortunately the humans would be lost because you can't survive in space, right? Unless they have their spacesuits on right at that time because of the cold the vacuum. But what about any bacteria? Would their normal flora die off right away? What do you think? I don't say no. No, exactly. Because remember, bacteria can survive in the cold, bacteria can survive in vacuums. So this would be like instantly preserving them. We actually, there's a, a theory out there, and it's, it's gotten to like the theory state. We're still going back and forth on it, but it's been proven pretty well. Um, that the first life forms on our planet might have come to us from a meteorite. There's always that question of where did life begin? And there's a big, you know, grouping of people that say that it probably was from a meteor that hit the Earth. And then in that meteor were bacteria they had traveled to us, and when they hit the earth, it was basically like they came out of their suspended animation and started growing. And those might be our first prokaryotes. And then over time, they evolved to create the eukaryotes. So there's that idea behind um, where life came from on our planet. Oops, way too fast, sir. Let me go back. Ahem, let me go back. There we go. So let's look a little bit more at some of our growth characteristics and things that our bacteria can do. So bacteria can grow very, very quickly. I mentioned that staph can replicate every 20 minutes. Um, there's some other bacteria that can replicate every 15 minutes. So these guys can grow really fast. And they're going to do this through the process of binary fission, which we'll see on our next slide. We also have eukaryotes, and that's like us, and they're going to go through the process of mitosis, which hopefully you've all seen. We'll do a quick review on it. We also have some eukaryotes that are able to do what we call budding. That's something that we see with yeast. It's basically where they create a little um, a identical cell that is their offspring, their daughter, but they stay attached to one another. And then we can have some special spores out there that are called comediospores that are made by molds. And then we can have fragments or filaments that can break off of molds or bacteria and reproduce. So here's a picture of binary fission. This process is super easy, which is why it can happen so quickly. The bacteria cell will basically make a replica of its DNA. So that means it's gonna go through the PPP pathway, right? We know that now. If it's making a replica of its DNA, it needs to make more DNA molecules. So it's going to make a replica of its DNA. It's going to elongate. So this is easy to see in a rod-shaped cell, but if we were to look at a coxy cell, we would see that it would also kind of get a little more oval looking right before it reproduces. Then what's gonna happen is it's gonna build its cell wall and split right in between the two cells that it's created. So it's like making itself bigger and then it builds a cell wall down the middle. It's gonna have a copy of DNA on each side. And then that cell wall, as it keeps building, will eventually pinch together and my cells will release. And so this process is very, very quick. It happen really fast. Um, e. coli and staph, like I said, every 20 minutes. Some bacteria even faster at 15. Budding is where we're going to see cells that are, for example, yeast cells, 
that are able to create a daughter cell but stay attached to their daughter. Now, because yeast are eukaryotes, remember that yeast has a nucleus. So since it's a eukaryote, it's gonna go through the same process that we do, it's gonna go through mitosis. So we're going to, again, look at that. And with mitosis, that means it can't replicate as quickly as a prokaryote. Mitosis takes about 24 hours, so it's gonna take you more time to do this. We can have this happen with either diploid or haploid yeast. What does that mean? Does anybody remember those terms from biology? Excellent. So diploid is two. What that means is they are going to be, for example, we're diploid. We have a set of double chromosomes. We have a set of moms and we have a set of dads. Okay, so we are considered diploid because we have two chromosome sets. Um, some yeast out there are going to be diploid. Some yeast out there are going to be able to grow as a single haploid. So basically they just have one set of chromosomes. So a haploid means one set of chromosomes. The easy way to remember that, I think haploid is half. Haploid H for half. And so that just means a single set as opposed to a double set. Okay. Here's a picture of our budding yeast. I love this. It's basically like the cell creates its daughter and then it never wants to let go. It's like, no, you're staying with me forever. So they never physically separate. They're always together. Now, they'll function independently. They'll work and get their own nutrients. They're not really supporting each other. They function independently, but they stay attached. And you can always tell when you're looking at yeast cells under a microscope because they have that kind of budding appearance. It's usually a big cell with a small cell. A lot of times they'll almost look like little bowling pins. They'll have like, you know, the bigger one at the bottom and the smaller one on top. So it's almost like a little bowling pin. So mitosis, which is the process we just saw, that's going to be where we have a parent cell that is going to create an identical daughter cell. And so again, this is what we do with our bodies. Um, the reason we do mitosis for us and bacteria do, or not bacteria, yeast do it for the same reason, is a lot of times for growth, for replication. We do it for replacement of old and damaged cells. So, for example, we shed our skin cells and we have new cells that are going to grow through the process of mitosis. And so with this then, the process is going to take a little more time than what we saw with binary fission. So the first step of mitosis is that we have to create a copy of our DNA. So we're going to replicate our DNA. That's going to happen in a step that we refer to as interphase. So that's going to be interphase. Does this ring a bell? You guys have had this in your other classes, right? Okay, phew. All right, so we're going to go through this kind of quickly because I know you've had it before. So replication is going to occur in interphase. We will then go through the process of cell separation, which occurs in mitosis. And then we go through the process of physical separation, which is going to be in cytokinesis. So here's a picture of the process then. Did I go too fast? Are you guys okay? Sorry, cytokinesis. <laughs> Sorry. I saw everybody looking around at me like, wait a minute, woman, we'll go back. Okay. So cytokinesis. Cyto means cell and kinesis means splitting. So it's cell split. Okay. So if we were to look at an overview of this process, again, we replicate the DNA in interface. That's the signal to the cell that it's time to get ready to replicate. It's then going to go through mitosis. That's where we're going to prepare for separation. We're going to have our copies of DNA move to each side of the cell. We're going to have copies of organelles move to each side of the cell. Um, it's a big process. That's why it takes more time than 20 minutes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to physically separate the cells in the last stage, which is cytokinesis. Now, to do this and make a copy of our DNA, we do something called semi-conservative replication. The idea behind this is instead of trying to create two new strands of DNA from our two old strands, that would be like kind of risky, we take our two old strands and split them and create a copy with each old strand. Does that make sense? So instead of trying to make two new things that are completely like new to each other, we just separate the old strands and we only have to make one new copy in each one. So that allows us to make sure that we don't have mistakes. So that's a pretty smart way to be able to replicate. So there's four main stages associated with the process of mitosis. And again, hopefully this is review. 
Um, we're going to have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. You can remember their um, order by coming up with a mnemonic. So something like, people make amazing things, um, pass me another tri-tip, pass me another taco, I have lots of great ones, um, a teacher, pass me another test. So you can come up with your own acronym, whatever helps you remember their order. So the first stage that we're going to see is that we're going to see that we have prophase. And when you hear prophase, think of that P of being plain to see. So what happens in prophase is our chromosomes condense, they coil up together tightly. And if I was to look at the cell, I would see the chromosomes inside. Okay, so they'd be tightly coiled together. My nuclear envelope breaks down, so my nucleus opens up to allow the DNA to move. And I have special proteins called spindle fibers that are gonna attach to my DNA kind of like a fishing line. The idea behind this then is they're gonna help move the DNA to where it needs to go. We wanna make sure we don't lose some of our genes when we're doing this process. So we're gonna be very careful as we do it. We have M for the middle phase, which is going to be um, the metaphase. And what's gonna happen here is that our chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. And then what's going to happen is we're going to get ready to separate them. The idea here, again, is we're trying to account for all of our chromosomes. And so it's easier to have them line up first, make sure they're all ready to go, and then we can go to our next stage, which is anaphase. When you see anaphase, think of A for apart. So I'm pulling the chromosomes apart from one another. And so when I do this, what's gonna happen is that they are going to be able to move to opposite poles. So they're gonna to move to opposite poles. The next stage that we're going to hit is telophase. And if you see a cell in this phase, it looks a little funky. You would see two nuclei at the end of the cell. So two nuclei at each end of the cell. And the cell looks a little like misshapen. It's like a little bit oblong when you look at it. So you can see it there in red. This is going to be where the DNA is now physically separated from one another. So now all I have to do is I have to basically get ready to put the nucleus back in place and get ready for the final stage, which occurs separate from mitosis, which is cytokinesis. Cytokinesis, the way this is going to occur for us, we don't have cell walls. So since we don't have cell walls, we're not going to be building a wall down the middle. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have proteins that are in the plasma membrane that start to contract and pinch together. Think of like a drawstring bag. Like when you pull that string, how it pinches together and closes your bag, that's what's happening. These are proteins that start to contract, and as they contract, they pinch together and they pinch the cell in half. And so then we actually get physical separation. So you can see where these proteins are starting. This is called a cleavage furrow. They start to pinch in at that little valley region. And so then what's gonna happen is when they pinch in, they're going to allow physical separation at that point. So if we were to put this all together then, here is our interface. Again, interface is going to be where we replicate our DNA and our organelles. Next, we're going to have our prophase. This is where our DNA becomes plain to see, and we're going to be able to see that the nuclear envelope is opening up and the DNA is ready to go. So next we're gonna have metaphase. We're gonna line up in the middle of the cell, make sure we're all accounted for, and we're going to have spindle fibers, making sure that the DNA moves to the locations that we need it to. Next is anaphase. This is where our DNA is gonna separate, pull apart, and move to opposite sides or opposite poles of the cell. Lastly, we're going to have telophase. That's the end of mitosis is telophase. And this is where we're going to see two nuclei. So telophase is two. And we're going to have the nuclear envelope condense. Now we get to the final stage, which is going to be cytokinesis. So with yeast, they stay in telophase. That's why we have budding. They never physically separate. So the yeast cells stay in telophase. They never go to cytokinesis. For us, we always go to cytokinesis and that results in our two daughter cells. Now, the daughters that we create are exact clones. So we're always going to be creating the exact clones of ourselves. So in our bodies, we have areas where this occurs frequently. I mentioned our skin cells. 
our skin cells are going to be constantly undergoing mitosis. Whenever we have injuries or damage or scrapes, they're going to be undergoing mitosis. We have some cells that are undergoing mitosis only when they're damaged. So this would be in places like our liver. So if we eat or consume something that's toxic, let's say that we consume some wine or we consume something that our body doesn't agree with, it will send that toxin or that alcohol to the liver. And remember, the liver is full of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Do you guys remember that? The smooth ER? And what did the smooth ER help do? Detoxify, right? So it's going to be going to the liver to help with detoxification. So those liver cells, if they get too damaged, they can replace themselves. The liver is actually the only organ that we have that can regenerate. Did you guys know that? So you can actually do a liver donation to somebody if they need a new liver, and they can take over half of your liver and your liver will grow back. Isn't that cool? I wish the kidneys and things like that would do that. That'd be so cool. We do have some areas in our body though where cells never undergo mitosis. Like once we're born, then they stop going through mitosis. And this would be like our neural cells. So ones associated with our spinal tissues, they stop growing at certain points in our development. This is why if we get a spinal injury, we can't always, you know, recover. We might lose the ability to walk. We might lose or the ability to, to move our hands. Um, that's because we've damaged the spinal tissue and it can't regenerate. There is a lot of research in this right now, though, with stem cells. You guys heard of stem cells. What is a stem cell? Anybody know? Yeah. It's an undifferentiated cell. Excellent. It's a baby cell. It's an undifferentiated cell. The idea behind this is when our cells develop, when they're developing as an embryo and then later as we start to grow, whatever cells they're close to, that inspires them to become that cell. So in other words, if I'm a cell in the heart, I'm going to become a cardiac cell. And if a new cell is born, it's going to too become a cardiac cell. We say that it's differentiated. It's, it's found its destiny in life. Stem cells are baby ones that haven't decided what they want to be when they grow up. So what we can do, what we're doing with stem cell research, is we would do an injection in the damaged spine area with the hope that those cells would see other spinal cells or neural cells. They would turn into those and they would regenerate for us. So that's our hope. So that's what we've been looking through with um, stem cell research. Now, unfortunately, sometimes we do. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Where are those stem cells? Where do they pull them from? Good question. So we get a lot of them from umbilical cords. That's actually one thing that they'll ask you if you have a child, they'll say, do you want to save their umbilical cord? Don't do it. You're going to be paying like for 20 years of storage fees for something that they're probably never going to use, they're never going to appreciate it anyway after you pay for it. And then you can always have access to stem cells. Um, so umbilical cords are a big one. They used to get them from aborted fetuses. They avoid that now. So especially human fetuses. Um, they can get them from fetuses, though, that are not fetuses, but developing egg cells that are used for, like, IVF. If you have a patient that's, you know, maybe they went through the IVF process and they created 40 embryos. You know, sometimes that happens. Well, what are they going to do with all 40 embryos? There's adoption processes. You can adopt those embryos. But another thing they can do is they can donate them to science, and science will use that cell. So nothing from it. They won't grow it. They just have it as that cell. So that's one thing they can do. Um, we also have stem cells in our bodies. So even as adults, we have stem cells deep into our fingers, so in our skin tissue, we have stem cells in our eyes. Um, so we do have them present, and we're finding that we have more than we ever thought. We used to think it was like really limited, but now we have more, so we can get them pretty easily. Yeah. But those stem cells on our hands, for example, can they grow as different kinds of cells or not? They really? can. If they're deep dermals, they haven't differentiated yet. So you have to go really deep to, to extract them. So the answer is yes, they can. But usually they're going to prefer to use umbilical cords. It's just so much easier and they're just such a higher number. So And, and those are things that people, most people can donate. Um, there's a few groups like Native Americans, they keep their umbilical cords. A lot of the tribes will bury them as a ceremony. So And that's, that's fine. So you have the choice to decide what you want to do with it. So cancer is where we have a cell that gets stuck in mitosis. And so what happens here is the cell goes through mitosis, and then for some reason, the DNA has either mutated or something's happened with it, and it says, okay, we're going to go through the mitosis again. So it keeps replicating. 
As it keeps replicating, these cells start to stack on one another, and that's going to be the formation of a tumor. So that's the beginning of a tumor. And so what can happen, unfortunately, is if the cells just keep growing, these, we call them oncogenes, they're mutations that keep the cell dividing, these oncogenes will allow the cell to continue to make replicas of itself, and that can eventually lead to full cancer. Most of our cells have what are called tumor suppressive genes, which basically try to prevent this from happening. So for whatever reason, cancer cells are when we get stuck. Haley. Um, is that how many tell like different types of cancer depending on where the tumor is? or which specific cell has like grown on top of each other, yes. depending on the place? Yes, they can tell based on the location, they can tell based on which cells are involved, whether they're squamous, whether like, they can look at all of that. Um, they can also tell if it has metastasized, that's a term we hear a lot. Metastasized means that the cells have broken away, gone into the bloodstream or the lymph, and are now traveling in the body. And so the idea behind that is wherever they stop, they could develop a new tumor. So that's always a concern if they've metastasized, that means they've separated. So we try to get the tumor early enough to remove it before it started to spread. That's the, the goal of every cancer researcher. Other ways that organisms can replicate, molds can do so through the process of what are called conidiospores. So we've learned about endospores. Those were bacterial bases, and I told you those were not replication. Those were little saving pods, right? Canidiospores are going to be different from endospores. They are actually true replication. And so what happens is that the mold will have its cells divide. It will create a spore unit, which is a little cell that's going to be movable. And if you get really close to them, they almost look like little lollipops. They are like a flower even. They have this stem, which we call a hyphae, and the little spores all over. And if you barely touch them, they're super powdery, they go poof, like a little dandelion, and the spores go everywhere. This is why we always find molds in places like in our homes with on bread and things like that. It's because it's really hard to get rid of them. And we personally, like right now, we're covered in spores. They're, they're in the air, they're in the environment, so it's just all around us. Here's a picture of when we get concerned, though. Um, this is a mold gone wrong. So this is called stachybotrys. This is the mold that's associated with sick mold syndrome or sick school syndrome. You might have heard of those. Um, basically, Stachybotrys is a black mold. We are fortunate that we really don't have it here. It's extremely rare. Um, we tend to have more of what's called aspergillus, and we'll talk about that a little later, but it's a harmless mold. The difference between the two is the Stachybotrys, the spores that it releases, are ones that a lot of us are sensitive to meaning that when we walk in this bathroom, we would get a headache, an upset stomach, we wouldn't feel good. Yeah. Does that grow like more like into the tropical area? We do. We tend to see it more in the south. We tend to see it in areas like in Florida. So areas that are humid, areas that are very moist. And so we're lucky here because we're not that hot. So we don't get that moist. Where we see mold growing is usually in our bathrooms. And again, that's usually the harmless variety. Do you know the easiest way to get rid of mold in your bathroom? What should you clean it with? Bleach. Bleach. Yeah, bleach. Bleach will annihilate pretty much everything. So if you spray a bleach mixture onto your bathtub or wherever you see mold, it will actually kill off the cells. And then you can stop the mold. Okay, let's talk about ways that we can measure growth. So we can measure growth by looking at it and by seeing bacteria on our plates. But what's the process that's occurring? Well, first of all, when we put a bacterial culture onto a petri dish, we refer to the first few hours that it's on that petri dish as its lag phase. The lag phase is going to be where the bacterium is getting used to its new environment. It's figuring out what nutrients are in the petri dish or in the tube, whatever we put it in. It's figuring out what enzymes it needs to create for food. So it's in this area where it's just kind of getting its bearings. If you think of like, if you got picked up and dropped off somewhere, one of the first things you kind of do is kind of look around to figure out what's going on. So that's the lag phase. We don't see a lot of activity. It's more like they're figuring out where they are. Next, we see the log phase. And log means we're getting rapid growth. So this is where the bacterium has decided, hey, this is pretty good. I like this environment. 
So it's going to start growing very, very quickly. It's going to use as many nutrients as it can, as fast as it can for competition. And we're going to see that we have a high number of new cells. So lots of growth, very low death. Then we hit the stationary phase. The stationary phase is going to be where our population kind of starts to stabilize. We have an equal amount of death as with an equal amount of birth. So in other words, what's happened here is our nutrients are starting to get a little low, space is getting a little limited, some of the bacteria are feeling stressed by that, so they're dying off. Some are still in a good location with nutrients, so they're still reproducing. So we're seeing this kind of balance. However, as the petri dish sits, we're going to eventually hit the death phase. And the death phase is where they've used all the nutrients, they've used all the space, and so now our cells are going to start to have more death than growth. And so they start to die off. And so we see this whether we're growing things on a plate, whether we're growing them in a broth, a deep, whatever. That's what we're going to see. Now, one of the things we can do to determine how many bacteria are in a sample is we can do something called plate counts. And this is just as exciting as it sounds. You get to sit and count colonies of bacteria. And that, that's like excitement right there, right? So the problem we run into is if we want to do this for like the food industry, the dairy industry, or even like soil checks or water testing, we want to see how many colonies are present, but we also need to be careful because sometimes we might have so many present that we can't count. So let's say, for example, we have something like a milk sample, and we mentioned milk's not sterilized or it has you know, endospores in it. If I put milk on a petri dish and it hasn't been pasteurized correctly or hasn't been you know, fixed correctly, I can see a lot of growth. So what I'll do is I'll do a dilution of my sample ahead of time. So for example, if I want to see how many bacteria are in a gram of hamburger, I take that gram of hamburger and put it in a tube and shake it to emulsify it. And then from there, I would take a sample and go into a new test tube, mix, another sample into a new test tube, mix, and the idea is I'm diluting out my cell number to begin with. It's almost like doing a street plate in a tube. We're going to get down to a countable range. Then with our final dilution, whatever that may be, the one that we feel is the best, we're going to take that sample and we're going to put it on a petri dish. And we're going to, instead of streaking it with a loop, we're going to do what's called a spread plate. And that means we're going to spread it all over the surface of the dish. Then we're going to let it incubate. Our goal is to get a countable number of colony forming units, CFUs. And what we can do then is we can take the number of cells that we counted, and we can divide that by the amount that we plated and the total dilution, and we can determine how many cells were in an original sample. Just so you guys can breathe, I'm not going to have you do this calculation. I want you to know how it works, but I'm not going to have you calculate it. And the reason for that is every lab I've ever worked in, we have this on an Excel sheet. So if you go into a lab, you're going to sit there and type it into an Excel sheet. So you don't have to do it by hand. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to have you do something you're not going to use. So, but I do want you to understand it so that if you do go into a lab and you type something in an Excel sheet, you know what's happening. Okay, so you understand the basis. Okay, so one method we can do, as I mentioned, is to do that spread plate method. And then the other method we can do is that we can do a pour plate method, which is where we are going to put our sample into the petri dish and then pour some media on top and swirl it. And the idea behind this is that we can also grow anaerobes this way. If they're underneath the auger when we poured it in the petri dish, it's anaerobic and so they'll actually grow. So we can get anaerobes and aerobes on the same plate. Now, the problem with doing a pour plate is if your media is too hot, which is always hard, you know, you're trying to find that balance of pouring it while it's still liquid before it gets to 40 degrees, but not too hot that it burns the bacteria. It's a really hard balance. If you pour it too hot, you kill off all your cells, you boil them. So it's kind of a, a harder balance to do pour plates. And here we are going to do spread plates. So we're going to have a lab where we're going to actually do deletions and do spread plates. We'll get to try this out. Um, some of the food that we're going to test in here are going to be things like hot dogs. We're going to see like how dirty they are. Um, we're going to do sprouts, which are like garden things. So we're going to test a bunch of different stuff in here. And some milk. We're going to test some milk. 
Okay, the other thing then is that we'll incubate our plates that we set up and we're gonna come in the next day and we're gonna count how many units we have. The goal is to get between 25 to 250. So 25 to 250 is a good countable range. If I'm under that, that means statistically I'm probably not in a good zone. So, like I want to do something that has a statistical number to it. So 25 is good. If I'm over 250, I have a hard time counting that much. That's like too many bacteria. So our goal is to get something that's like within this countable range, which would be something like this plate. So the third, or actually the fourth plate that we see, that would be the one that's the countable range. We can also count bacteria by doing what's called membrane filtration. This is how we do a lot of our water sampling. If I want to see how many bacteria are present in Lopez Lake, for example, I don't have to dilute it because it's already diluted. It's already surrounded by water. So I could take a sample, like a gallon, I could bring it into a lab, and I could pour that gallon into a filtration unit. This filtration unit is basically going to be a vacuum unit, so it'll suck the water through. And what is in the between the water being poured in and sucked through is a little filter. And this filter will capture any bacteria that's present in the water. So they get stuck on this filtration. And then what I can do is after I've sucked that water through and trapped the bacteria on the filter, is I can use tweezers to gently pull the filter paper up and put it right on top of some media on a Petri dish. So this is a Petri dish with the filter sitting right on top of it. The filter's so thin, the nutrients from the Petri dish can diffuse through. And so your bacteria will actually start to grow on the filter paper. So you can come in the next day and you'll see little bacteria growing. And then you can count how many are there based on their position in the squares. So it's a pretty fast process. So here's a picture of the filtration process. So I'm just pouring a water sample in. There would be a vacuum unit attached here that's pulling the water through. So vacuum unit down here. And then any bacteria that's present is gonna get trapped on this filter, which would be right here. And then I can take that filter off, the filter would be right here, and put it onto a Petri dish. And then I can go ahead and um, send that Petri dish to my incubator and then see what's going on. Another way that I can count how many bacteria are present is to just do a statistical estimate. This is the, called the MPN, or most probable number test. We do this in water testing too. And so the MPN test is going to be one, did I go too fast so I need to go back on? Oh, really? Okay. Um, the MPN test is going to be one where I take a set of test tubes that have the same media in them. And I can do like three sets of five. So I'm going to have a rack with five test tubes, another rack with five test tubes, and another rack with five test tubes. I'll then have my sample, my gallon of water. And I'm going to take a mill from that gallon and go a mill into each test tube. The idea behind this is I'm running it basically like in triplicate. So I'm getting an, a good count. Because when we're trying to get a sample from water, it's so dilute. Again, it's like you might hit on it, you might not. And so we're trying to make sure that we get enough sample set up that if there is a pathogen in there, we find it. That's the idea behind an NPN. We then come in the next day and we look for a color change. A color change means bacterial growth. And then we count how many are positive. So there's three out of five here. We compare that with a chart and it says, okay, if there's three out of five, then most likely you have around 5,000 cells. So there's a chart that you'd use as a comparison, okay? So this would be something like a chart that we would use. So this is showing a test run in triplicate. So I can set it up at the top with four test tubes. At the, the last two are with um, five test tubes. And this is just showing different combinations. So in my triplicate, I might run in where I have five that are positive, and my other sets of five, I had zeros. So I didn't see anything. Again, it's just the luck of the draw, okay? So if I saw that, that would indicate that for every 100 mils, I have about 23 bacteria. You see how that works? So I'm just reading across the table. So I come in, I count how many are positive, how many are negative, record it, read across, and then I can guesstimate how many bacteria I have. Now, those are all direct counts. There are ways that we can determine how many cells are present based on statistics and counting. We can also do indirect counts. And indirect counts is where we're just going to get a quick number of how many cells are present 
but they're not as accurate. And the reason for that is I don't know if these cells are living or if they're dead. I just know that they're present. So they might be really old cells, and I would think, oh, I've got thousands of cells, but they're old and dead, they've been killed off, so they're not going to cause any illness. So the problem with indirect counts is they're not super accurate. We just know they're kind of a guess. So one way we can do an indirect count is through the process of turbidity. If I take a test tube and I put bacteria in it, and that's what we see in the second part, where it's full of bacteria, and I shoot light through it, that light will bounce. And I can measure that light bouncing and determine how many cells are present in that solution. Now, you might be wondering, why would I ever use this? Why do I want to determine how many cells are present? Well, do you remember those plates that we showed you that had the antibiotic discs on them? Yeah. Okay. So think about it this way. I would want a lab to do a test on an antibiotic you know, design. And I have maybe a lab in California, a lab in Texas, a lab in Europe, a lab in Florida. They're all going to test for me. But what if they're all starting with a different number of bacteria? What if the lab in California is starting with 5 million and the lab in Florida is starting with 100? Am I going to get a difference with my antibiotics? Yeah, that's a huge difference. That means that the easiest thing to do is to have them all start with about the same number of cells. They would do a turbidity test. They would take a test tube to set up the test. They would inoculate some bacteria in that test tube, and they would get a set turbidity. And the company would tell them what the turbidity number should be. So they would shoot light through it until they found the turbidity that the company said. And that could be usually around, you know, around a million in some cells. And then they can put that onto the Petri dish and then test the antibiotic from there. The idea then is we're all starting at the same point. So that's how we would use turbidities, is they all start us at the same point. Now, again, they're not super accurate. I might have a million and you know, 401 and a million and 201. I'm not as worried. That's still closer than starting with 100 versus a million. Okay. We use these a lot of times in clinical labs, like I said, to kind of set up a known turbidity. We refer to them as McFarland standards. McFarland standards are basically going to be test tubes that have latex beads in them that show you different amounts of turbidity levels. Do you see how these black lines start to fade as I get to a higher turbidity? So what I can do is I can look at the, the visibility of these black lines through my test tube. And I can compare it with one of these controls. So these are controls that are set for a certain number. And if I see the same cloudiness, then I can bet that I have about the same number of cells in them. So let me explain. Right here on this end, I have a McFarland 0.5. There's a 0.5 showing. For McFarland 0.5, I have about 1 times 10 to the 7th or 1 times 10 to the 8th cells. Okay. So I would get a clean test tube. I'd put some E. coli in it until it matched the turbidity of this one. Everybody with me on that? So I hold it up to the car to make sure that it looked like this and not like this, okay? So this would tell me, yeah, if I'm matching the turbidity with this one, then that means I have about one times 10 to the seventh or one times 10 to the eight cells. Again, it's just making sure that labs are testing the same. So we can kind of summarize this then and say that growing microbes, we can do so directly where we actually see them, we count them, we know that they're living. Um, we get actual numbers, that would be like our direct methods, or we can do it indirectly. There would be things like turbidity. Um, we can sometimes measure how quickly they're using like a sugar source. That would be like a metabolic activity. Some labs will do a dry weight. So some labs will take a water sample, run it through a filter, and then measure that filter and weight rather than growing it. And based on the weight change, they'll know how many bacteria are there. Again, the indirect methods tend to not be as you know, uh, accurate, but they're close enough. Okay, why is it difficult to measure realistically the growth of mold on a plate count method? Did you guys remember that picture of that mold, how it was like all kind of spread out over the surface of the plate? Do you remember that? So one of the reasons it would be hard is because if you think about that mold, what do you count? Do you count the single spot that's spreading out? 
do you count all of the spores that are present? It's kind of hard to know how you would do a count. So molds a lot of times are tricky because when you look at it, you might see one colony, but in that colony, you just have millions of cells spreading out and spores. So it's difficult to guesstimate. You know, we, we do the best we can. Direct methods usually involve or require an incubation time for a colony. Why is this not always feasible for analysis of foods? So I'm a food company. I made a food product. Let's say I made some chicken, and I've done some testing on it to see how many bacteria are present, but I have to you know, go ahead and grow them. Why would this be an issue with my chicken? Time is money. Time is money. Excellent. Yeah, so one of the problems companies run into is they have a certain expiration date. And if they waited until all of their bacterial testing was done, by the time they released that food for sale, it would have like two days. So what most food companies do is they do a quick initial test on the food, they release it, and keep a sample and continue to run the rest of their testing. This is why we occasionally get recalls. A recall doesn't necessarily mean that a customer got sick. A recall means that when the company continued their testing, they suddenly found that the bacteria levels were getting higher than expected or something was different with that product. And so then as a safety recall, they'll let all the customers know. As you can imagine, they don't want to do this. They're very careful with what they can do before they release it for sale. But it's just that they're stuck because, as you said, time is money. The longer they hold something, the less time they have to actually sell it. Okay? So that's the reason sometimes we get recalls. It's not like somebody really got sick from it. It's just that they were exposed, um, potentially, to something that can make them sick. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and we're going to go to our next chapter, which is Chapter 7. We can get started on that one today. Yay! I'm excited. I know you guys might not be good. Hold on. My computer's being on, so give me a second. Chapter 7. So what we just covered in Chapter 6 was talking about ways that we could be able to, you know, grow our bacteria, keep them healthy, keep them happy, and be able to use them for testing. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about ways that we can kill our bacteria, ways that we can control them and keep their numbers down. So these are going to be ways that we can keep them from making us sick or making us ill. So with this then, oh yeah, I have a quick question, let's see. Um, sorry, I have a quick question. Uh, the BSL for influenza, that was a BSL-2. Sorry, there was a question on BSL of influenza, that was 2. And the last question on chapter 6 slides, oh yeah, it was the, okay, so the BSL was 2. Okay. So with this one, we're going to go into some terminology, and we're going to talk about how bacteria have been affecting our population since the beginning of time. So let's start with that one. So with bacteria, we didn't really understand what they were, but we knew there was something going on with you know, food preservation, where food would expire or ruin if it sat too long. So we talked about ways that we could preserve food in this class was to do things like salt or to do things like um, sugars. And so this is why spices were so important. Like when you read about the ancient, um, I shouldn't say ancient, but when you read about early history, um, a lot of the European settlers, when they were out sailing, they were looking for spices, right? And you might be going, well, what was the deal with spices? Like were people just like spice you reckon? Like what's the deal? They were trying to find spices to preserve food. That was really what their big push was. And so we learned that if we put spices on foods or salts on foods, they would last longer. We didn't understand it was because they were hypertonic. We just knew it worked. 
we also knew that silver had some sort of effect on bacteria. And so, for example, the concept of silverware. Isn't that kind of funny? We still use that term silverware, but we don't actually have silver in our drawers, right? Well, the first utensils that were designed were actually true silverware. And the reason for that was they learned that silver would prevent the growth of bacteria. They knew that if they put silver in a drawer and they pulled it out later, it was still clean. If they put bronze in a drawer and pulled it out later, it would sometimes have mold on it. And again, they didn't really know what they were seeing. They just knew that there was a difference. That's where the term silverware comes from. Another thing that they noticed was that their water would stay fresher if they had a silver coin in it. And the idea behind this is that, again, silver, and we prove this now, is antibacterial. And so there's something in the silver element that affects the bacteria in a negative way, and it stops their formation of enzymes. And so it causes them to die. So Egyptians learned this. When they would take in water from the Nile, they would have barrels, and they would throw silver coins in them to keep the water tasting fresh. The Romans knew this. The Romans would actually encourage people to throw coins into their water supplies. They had water canals to help it stay fresh. What do we do when we see a fountain? We make a wish and we throw a coin. That is the greatest propaganda that the Romans ever did. And we still do it to this day. So the idea behind this was that we convinced people to throw coins into water. The reason we wanted their coins in the water was to preserve the water. So at that time, they were using a silver-based coin. Nowadays, our coins aren't really so much silver, and nobody's drinking the water. But we still have it part of our culture. Isn't that funny? And it's like a worldwide thing. Like, no matter where you go across the globe, if you see people at a fountain, they're throwing coins in there. And that was from the days when we were sterilizing water. Isn't that neat? It's kind of neat when some of this stuff comes through. It's like our flowers at our weddings, right? Same idea. Okay, so we had some scientists that kind of knew that things were going on with bacteria. Remember our friend, Dr. Lister? He was our first surgeon that really practiced aseptic technique. And so he used a carbolic acid, which is basically a phenol compound, it's technically an alcohol compound, that he would use to clean surgical sites before and after a surgery. When he did this, the nosocomial death rate dropped immensely. Nosocomial, that's a term you hear a lot. Does anybody know what nosocomial means in microbiology? Nosocomial means that it's an illness associated with medical care. So in other words, if I go into a hospital and I have a knee replacement and I end up with pneumonia, Maybe that pneumonia came from being under the anesthesia. So we would say that was a nosocomial infection. I got it while I was in the hospital. Let's say I go to the hospital and I get a MRSA infection while I'm there. That would be a nosocomial infection. It's something that occurred while you were in the hospital itself. Something new that you didn't have going in. That's what nosocomial means. So nosocomial then, yes. Are hospitals liable for that? Can you sue a hospital? Yes, they are. They're very liable. And not always so much of a lawsuit, but what will happen is insurance companies will make the hospital pay for your treatment. So there actually is a big thing where, like, if you end up with MRSA while you're in the hospital, the hospital has to pay for all of your care afterwards. And the insurance company won't pay for it. So as you can imagine, that really pushes hospitals to do a really good job. You know, to make sure that you don't catch anything while you're in there. So with Lister, he started using these phenol compounds. He started using you know, sterile techniques. And his death rate started to drop. So nosocomial infections at that time were around 30%. He got them down to about 10 to 15%. In some hospitals, nosocomial infections were 50%. If you went in and had a baby, you had a 50% chance of walking out of there again. Those are some bad odds. You know? I mean, those aren't that great, like 50-50. So, up to 25% of mothers in Lister's hospital were dying because of infectious exposure. So I mentioned that before, you know, people weren't washing their hands, they would go and you know, remove an abscess and then go deliver a newborn, you know, horrible stuff like that. So thanks to him, he brought that rate down again to about 10 to 15%. Phenol, we still use it today. If you've ever used Carmex or if you've ever had a sore throat and used chloroseptic spray, Phenol is the numbing agent that's in there. Like when you put Carmex on your lips, it kind of tingles. 
or when you spray your um, throat, and, or if you use Origel, that also will have phenol in it. Anything that numbs you really quickly, it has a phenol base in it. And so that also helped with his surgical sites because it helped keep the patients, you know, calm because they didn't feel everything. So what a surgeon would love is they would love to have a ability to have everything be aseptic. And asepsis, again, means the absence of contamination or the absence of life. And so luckily, there's a lot we can do to keep our rooms or to keep areas aseptic. So we can use aseptic technique. Um, we do that when we sterilize our loops. There's just different things that we can do to keep contamination rates down. And now that we know more about bacteria, we're really able to do a good job of controlling their rates. So sterilization. Sterilization means that I'm killing or removing all microbial forms of life. And to be completely sterile, that means I also have to remove endospores. So that's why I told you before, milk is not considered to be sterile because it does still have endospores in it. So to be sterilized means that I have to have undergone a major physical change. Usually that's associated with heat. So for example, we use our Bunsen burners. We cook the heck out of the bacteria. We fry them, right? They don't like that. It kills them immediately. And if there were any spores on my loop, they would die as well. That intense heat would kill them off. That's the idea. Now, we also have used this to keep people safe with the use of what's called commercial sterilization. Commercial sterilization is where we are going to heat food to just a high enough temperature to kill off endospores of certain organisms associated with food illness. The biggest one that we work with is Clostridium botulinum. That is the one that we live in fear of. You guys have heard of it as CBOT, right? Or uh, botulism. So CBOT's a little gram-positive endospore-forming rod. And unfortunately for us, it is one that releases a very nasty toxin that results in paralysis of the nerves. So it's often associated with improperly prepared canned food. So this is why maybe your grandmother told you when you were shopping not to get cans that were dented or cans that were like inflated a little bit. It's because when CBOT grows, it produces a gas, so it'll push the can out a little bit. If it gets dented, it's also the possibility that maybe there was gas present and you can't see it now. That dent like covers from the can kind of pushing out or exploding kind of a thing. So CBOT is something we want to be really careful of. There was an incident where there was a woman at Walnut Grove, I think it was, um, near Pleasanton up in San Francisco, who died of CBOT poisoning three years ago. She stopped at a gas station and she had some of their nacho chips. And the big nacho cheese vats that they have at gas stations, it hadn't been changed out properly. And so in the bottom, it was super thick and anaerobic. And Clostridium botulinum is anaerobic, so it's growing at the bottom of this thick cheese sauce. She took a scoop from the bottom because she wanted it to be hot and put it on her chips. She left, she ate her nachos. About 48 hours later, she wasn't feeling good. She thought maybe she had the flu. Another day progressed and she started to have problems breathing. The CBOT caused paralysis of her lungs. So it actually shut down her body. She kept saying, no, I'm okay, I don't need to go to the ER. I'm good, I think it's just you know, respiratory illness, whatever. Stayed home. By the time they finally got to the hospital, she was already in cardiac arrest. And so she ended up dying from CBOT exposure. And then they had to figure out where she got exposed. They had to like backtrack. So again, CBOT is something that we want to make sure is gone. We want to be really careful with it. Here's a picture of a young boy that has CBOT. You can see how his face is very relaxed. We refer to that as floppy baby syndrome, like babies that are exposed to CBOT. They just kind of look like a rag doll. If you move them around, their muscles are, you know, just paralyzed. They have no movement of their muscles. Um, with this boy, he can't lift his eyelids. They're just completely, you know, paralyzed. He's just kind of stuck. His face, he can't smile, he can't talk, he's stuck. Um, we use this toxin, though, in beauty care nowadays. Have you guys ever heard of Botox? Botox is a toxin from C. botulinum. And what it does is it causes paralysis in the cells, which causes muscles to relax and get rid of wrinkle lines. 
I don't know. Personally, that just freaks me out. I know it's safe. Supposedly it's purified and counted, but just putting CBOT in my face is something I don't want to do. It's like, no, thank you. I will pass on that. But it's supposed to relax the muscles. It's like, I will keep the muscles. Okay, so we'll stop here. Oh, I had a question. Is that permanent? If he's, so for um, Botox, no, you have to go in and get shots constantly. Um, for the boy in the middle, he was able to be saved. He was able to get in and get treatment. Basically, they had to put him on a life support machine because his lungs were shutting down. So the same thing was happening to that woman, but they got him through it and were able to treat the CBA infection. All right, we're going to start lab at 10.35 today since I talked about it. Okay, so with our starch plate, remember, what was the enzyme that we were looking for? Amylase. Amylase. Good. We're looking for amylase. And what does that break down? The starch, right? It's going to eat the starch. Okay, and so the idea then is if the organism was able to eat the starch, what that means is the starch should be absent wherever that colony is growing. It's breaking the starch down. So to read this test out, like if you look at it right now, your plates are just going to show growth of both organisms. And I don't see anything visually different. I have to put something else on the plates. Does anybody remember what else we have to add? Graham's iodine. Graham's iodine, yeah. So on each side of the room, I have a couple bottles of Graham's iodine that are out. So you're going to flood over the surface of your colonies Graham's iodine. When I say flood, I mean put enough on there to completely cover them, kind of swirl it around the plate. Okay, so go ahead and go do that, and then we're going to look at what we see. So the gram iodine is on each side of the room. So if you're on this side of the room, you have two vials over there. If you're on this side of the room, I have more vials out, so if you have more students. And so the idea then is that we're going to be looking to see what kind of reaction that we get. So put it all over the surface of the colonies. Don't be afraid to use a lot so that you're almost covering the petri dish. Kind of swirl it around, and then we're going to look and see if we see a visual difference. Yes. Okay, what size? You got it. We're All right, so you're going to flood your petri dish with some starch, swirl it around, and then look and see if you see a difference. If it's easier, you can unscrew the lid to pour a little bit out. That might make it a little easier. Swirl it, and then do you see a difference? Nope, I can already see a difference. You're good. So, can I hold your plate up as an example? Okay, and I'll give it back to you, I promise. And I'll take the lid though. For sure. Do we need to like put more on top of that? You're actually, you're really good. Don't worry. I'm going to show the reaction that I want. That's perfect. Okay, so, that's some iodine on. Here's an example. I just have a little bit on the full Christopher's plate. Just a little bit swirling around, so it's covering both sides. Swirling a little bit, covering both sides. All right, so what are you noticing different between the way the two colonies look now? Yeah, you see the clear zone. So which one is creating a clear zone? I have your place, so you can't see it. <laughs> which one's creating a clear zone? Bacillus, excellent. So if I was to look at these, I have this clearing around the bacillus. I don't have that clearing around the E. coli. So the idea behind it is that the bacillus is producing amylase. And so what it's doing is it's eating the starch. Now, when I add the Graham's iodine, Graham's iodine will mix with any starch that is present. So Graham's iodine plus starch equals a dark 
bluish black color. So we'll just say dark color. All right. So that's the reaction I'm looking for. But if I just have Graham's iodine and the starch is all eaten, it's not going to create a dark color. What do I see instead? If the starch is gone, what are you guys seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing like halos, right? So if starch is gone, a halo or clearing forms, right? So what that means is that organism that is positive ate all of the starch. So there's no starch left to react with the Graham's iodine. Make sense? Okay. Any questions on that one? Everybody see the expected results. So bacillus should be positive. Parabesive should be positive and E. coli should be negative. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Spirit blue auger. What enzyme are we looking for? Lipase. Good. We're looking for lipase. And hold up your spirit blue auger to the light. What do you see? Do you see a difference? Oh, yeah. Yeah? You see a clearing? Can I steal yours for a second, Jasmine? Yeah. See, this is why nobody wants to sit in the front. I steal your place. <laughs> okay, do you see a nice clearing? See how staph has this clearing around it? Staph FB doesn't. So staph aureus is producing lipase. It is breaking down the lipids that are present in the olive oil that was inside that media, or the emulsion oil. So staph aureus is able to produce lipase, so it's positive. How about staph epi? Staph epi, not so much, right? So it's going to be negative on that test. How can I tell? There's a clearing of the fats, of the colored fats, I should say, due to lipase, all right? Okay, let's go on to the urea slant. Do you see a difference with your urea organisms? Aren't they pretty? Does everybody see the urea slants? I'm like a shark. <laughs> well, okay, do you see a difference with your urea slants? Yes, pink. Yeah, isn't it like the coolest punk rock color ever? It's like this really pretty pink color, right? Which one is producing that really pretty pink color? Bulgaris. Bulgaris, exactly. So what enzyme are we looking for? Urease, good. We're looking for the enzyme urease. Remember, if I'm able to break your urea down, I am going to increase the pH because I'm releasing a basic subunit. I'm releasing a hydroxide unit, so I'm going to increase my pH. When I increase my pH, I turn hot pink. It's like a really pretty fuchsia color, right? So the organism that should be positive for that is going to be the Proteus vulgaris. Sorry, I have very bad writing today. And the organism that should be negative is the E. coli. Okay, let's go to the gelatin auger. What enzyme are we looking for here? Gelatinase. And we set up last time Staph aureus, and we set up Staph epi. The way you're going to read this test is you're going to tilt your tubes. Which one shows a liquid component? Both. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 But more on the epi. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. We'll see what she says. How about yours? So this one? This one? Yeah. I stupidly like injected them. Okay. So let's look at our staph aureus and our staph epi. So staph aureus has a lot here that's liquid. If I turn it, which I kept this. If I turn it, it's going to like completely start to melt. The staph epi is showing a little liquid. The reason for that is the heat from the incubator. Let them sit out on your desk for a little bit, and what's going to happen is the staph epi is going to get solid again because it's out of the heat, and the staph aureus is going to stay liquid. So, and the longer these guys sit, the more days that they sit in there, 
the more obvious it becomes that the sap aureus is eating the gelatin. It's going to be to where I turn it like this and it's completely raw. So the reason we're seeing a little liquid with the staph FB is because the top part of the staph of the gelatin is a little melted from heat, just like when we make jello. You know, we melt the jello, same idea. The gelatin is what makes your jello solid. So if you let it sit a little bit, you'll see that it'll start to solidify and then it's going to get a little more solid with time. But you can already see the staph aureus, which is on the bottom here, has a bigger chunk. It's like actually eating the media as opposed to just melting it. Okay. All right. So on this one then with the gelatinase, staph aureus should be positive, sac FB should be negative. So on your lab quiz, the big one, the lab exam, you're going to want to know, what did we set up on these? Which one was positive? Which one was negative? Did we have to add anything, like Graham's iodine, to read it out? Uh, if so, what did we add? What did the reactions look like? So you'll want to be able to know all of this. I can tell you I've set up a um, starch plate, and I don't see a difference. What do I need to do? I need to add Graham's iodine. And then what do I need to look for? I need to look for a halo. Make sense? So those are the things you're going to want to know for your lab exam. And being able to write out the complete genus and species again is going to be very important. Okay, so today we're going to be setting up protein catabolism. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking to see if the organisms that are in the test tubes we're going to be setting up are able to break down the proteins that we've added to each of the test tubes. Now, these organisms, if they're able to eat the proteins, that means they're producing enzymes that convert the protein down and put it in the Krebs cycle. Remember, proteins and lipids are going to be going into the Krebs cycle. So this is going to be where they are going to be trying to break down nutrients. Now, each of these types of media, they have a little bit of either like glucose or sucrose. They have some sort of a sugar component to them so that if the organism cannot break the protein down, it can still grow. So we're going to be looking to see who is growing and then who is actually causing a reaction. So just because they're growing, just like the E. coli on the starch plate, doesn't mean they're producing the enzyme. Okay, so just like what we saw with that one, we're going to see the same thing here. So we're not looking to see who's inhibited, they're not selective, but they're differential. Okay, so with the phenylalanine slants, we're going to be looking to see if our organisms can break down proteins that contain phenylalanine. It's going to be the amino acid that's in them. So we're going to set up our slant today with our E. coli and with our proteus. And you'll notice when you look at them, they're the straw-colored slants that they have slip caps on. These are called slip caps. When you put them on, you just put them like right on just like this. And you'll notice that there's little vents on the side that allows oxygen exchange. So you don't have to shove them all the way down, you can leave them up a little. But to be honest, even if you push them all the way down, we'll still get oxygen in there because of those vents. I like to leave them up just a little bit. Okay, that's just a preference. So on your slants, you're going to be setting the slants up just like what you did in the past. You're going to be doing a fishtail kind of technique. I touch the loop to the bottom, and then I zigzag up the slant. I don't worry about punching into it, piercing into it, just using my typical loop. Okay, and I put on here loose caps like normal. Lysine decarboxylase broth. So in this case, we're going to be looking to see if the amino acid lysine can be broken down. Now remember, we talked before about how amino acids have an amine group and a carboxyl group. Hopefully that rings a bell. Okay, so if I'm decarboxylating, that's a huge word, right? You're decarboxylating, that means you're taking that amino acid and you're pulling the carboxyl group off. That's all we're saying. So remember, an amino acid is going to have a nitrogen side, that's the amine, and a carboxyl side, C double bond OOH. Okay? In this case, I'm producing an enzyme that's going to remove the carboxyl side. If this happens, I should see a pH shift up. Again, because that carboxyl group is going to have an OH group. So I'm going to be going towards the basic side. Okay? So what I'm going to do for the lysine decarboxylase broth, I'm going to inoculate one with Klebsiella, and your lab partner or you, you guys can do it in a different order, is going to inoculate the other one with Proteus. So each of you inoculates one. 
Then you have to stop after you've inoculated, and you're just going to use a loop to inoculate. So sterilize your loop, put it in the broth, wiggle it around, make sure you get your organisms off. Make sure before you start anything that you've tilted your organisms over to wake them up. What I'm going to do then is this step, very important. I'm going to add a layer of mineral oil on top. Ooh, that's intriguing. So I have mineral oil up here at the front of my desk. You might also have some in your drawer. You can check. If you don't have it in your drawer, I have some up front at each corner of my desk. The amount that you're going to add is about half to almost your full pinky. I want to make sure it's completely covered and I have like at least a couple millimeters to grow on. Okay. Why do you think I'm adding mineral oil? What do you think this is stopping coming into the media? Oxygen. Excellent. When I add mineral oil, I'm creating an anaerobic environment. And then to make sure I stay anaerobic, I'm going to go a step further and I'm even going to tight cap. So this is going to be one of the ones you're going to tight cap. So the idea behind this, our organisms will not do decarboxylase when there's oxygen present. It's one of those reactions that if there's oxygen present, because it's a lot of work, the organism won't do it. It just tends to be a little lazy. So we're going to force them to do it by taking oxygen away. We're going to put them in a more stressful environment. And so they're going to be using whatever energy source they can find, which in this case will be proteins, and especially looking at the lysine use. And we're adding oil to make it anaerobic, so they have to break those down. We're forcing them to do that decarboxylase step. All right? So next time when we come in, we're going to be looking for a difference between how these organisms reacted. All right, and we'll talk about what we're going to be looking for in detail next time. MIO. MIO is going to be one that you're going to use a needle to inoculate. So up until this point, we've been using loops. We're going to switch gears, and in our MIO, we're going to use a needle. MIO is an awesome tube. We use this a lot in medical labs because it's like three tests in one. It's motility, it's indole, and it's an ornithine test. The ornithine is a type of a protein. We're looking to see if it's able to break this protein down. We do indole, that's another protein test, so I'm getting two protein tests. And the motility is based on how I do my needle stick. I want to take my needle, sterilize it, put it in my broth, and sit around and shrug it a lot, pull it out and do one straight, straight, one straight stick in. There we go, I can't talk and then pull straight back up. The next time I come in, if my organism is modal, that means it's going to be moving out throughout the media. So I should see growth throughout the tube. If my organism is non-modal, it will only grow around where the needle stick is. So really quickly, I can tell if my organism can move or not. The reason this is important is this can help me key out some organisms. So I can tell right away, based on whether it's modal or not, which group of organisms I should be focusing on. It's very helpful. All right. So what I'm going to do with this one, stay straight. I cannot stay, speak today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stick it straight in and pull it straight out. There we go. I got it. Oh, jeez. And then I'm going to have a loose cap like normal. I'm not adding anything else to it at this point. All right. Next time, we're going to see how our organisms look after they've been incubated for a little bit. Now, the other thing that I want you to keep in mind is being careful as to which organisms you're using. Make sure we're not using the wrong ones or your results are going to be super wonky. Okay? And let's see, what else is there? For your test tubes that are used, your urea and stuff, where are those going to go? Into the graveyard. I'll put my graveyard sign up and I'll put a test tube rack out. I will put some more, I actually have two test tube racks in there for today, so you can put your other test tubes in there, okay? So you can put those back in the incubator when you're done. Um, do you need questions with that? Okay, if not, go ahead and get started. I'll turn the gas on and we'll get going here. I'll put my graveyard sign up.